you said that in some sense, becoming an adult means you take charge of your emotions. Mm -hmm. Maybe you never said that. Maybe I just made that up. But in the context of the mind, what's the role of emotion? And what is it? First of all, what is emotion? What's its role? It's several things. So psychologists often distinguish between emotion and feeling and in common day parlance, we do, don't. I think that an emotion is a configuration of the cognitive system. And that's especially true for the lowest level for the affective state. So when you have an affect, it's the configuration of certain modulation parameters like arousal, valence, um, your, your attentional focus, whether it's wide or narrow, interoception or exteroception and so on. And all these parameters together put you in a certain way to you relate to the environment and to yourself. And this is in some sense an emotional configuration. In the more narrow sense, an emotion is an affective state. It has an object. And the relevance of that object is given by motivation. And motivation is a bunch of needs that are associated with rewards, things that give you pleasure and pain. And you don't actually act on your needs, you act on models of your needs. Because when the pleasure and pain manifest, it's too late, you've done everything. But So you act on expectations what will give you pleasure and pain. And these are your purposes. The needs don't form a hierarchy, they just coexist and compete. And your organism has, to, or your brain has to find a dynamic homeostasis between them. But uh, the purposes need to be consistent. So you basically can create a story for your life and make plans. And so we organize them all into hierarchies. And there is not a unique solution for this. Some people eat to make art and other people make art to eat. And they might up be, end up doing the same things, but they cooperate in very different ways because their ultimate goals are different. And we cooperate based on shared purpose. Everything else that is not cooperation on shared purpose is transactional. I don't think I understood that last piece of the, uh, the achieving the homeostasis. Are you distinguishing between the experience of emotion and the expression of emotion? Of course. So uh, the experience of emotion is a feeling. And uh, in this sense, what you feel is an appraisal that your perceptual system has made of the situation at hand. Right. And it makes this based on your motivation yes. and uh, on the your estimates, not your, but of the subconscious geometric parts of your mind that uh, assess the situation in the world with something like a neural network. And this neural network is making itself known to the symbolic parts of your mind, mm -hmm. to your uh, conscious attention, via mapping the, uh, them as features into a space. So what you will feel about your emotion is a projection usually into your body map. So you might feel anxiety in your solar plexus, and you might feel it as a contraction, which is all geometry, right? Mm -hmm. Your body map is the space that is always instantiated and always available. So it's a, a very obvious cheat if your um, non-symbolic parts of your brain try to talk to your symbolic parts of your brain to map the feelings into the body map. And then you perceive them as pleasant or unpleasant, depending on whether the appraisal has a negative or positive valence. And then you have different features of them that give you um, more knowledge about the nature of what you're feeling. So for instance, when you feel connected to other people, you typically feel this in your chest region around mm -hmm. your heart. And you feel this as an expansive feeling in which you're reaching out, right? right. And it's very intuitive to encode it like this. That's why it's encoded like but this it's encoded. for most people. It's yes. encoded. It's a code. It's a code in which the non-symbolic parts of your mind talk to the symbolic ones. And then the expression of emotion is then the final step that could be sort of gestural or visual yeah. or so on. That's Let's just a part of the this communication. This probably evolved as part of an adversarial communication. Oh, so as soon as you started to observe uh, the facial expression and posture of others to understand what emotional state they are in, others started to use this as signaling and also to subvert your model of their emotional state. Right. So uh, we now look at the inflections, at the difference between the standard face that they're going to make in this situation. Right? Yeah. When you are at the funeral, everybody expects you to make a solemn face. But the solemn face doesn't express whether you're sad or not. It just expresses that you understand what face you have to make at a funeral. Nobody should know that, that you are tri tri triumphant. Mm -hmm. So when you try to read the emotion of another person, you try to look at the delta between uh, a, a sad, a truly sad expression and uh, the things that are animated, mating this face behind the curtain. So the in the interesting thing is, uh, so having done these, uh, having done this podcast um, and the video component, one of the things I've learned is that now I'm Russian and I, I, I just don't know how to express emotion on my face. One, I see that as weakness, but whatever the, People look to me after you say something. They look to my face 
to, to, to help them see how they should feel about what you said, which is fascinating because then they'll often comment on why did you look bored or why did you particularly enjoy that part or why did you whatever. It's a kind of interesting, uh, it makes me cognizant of I'm part, like you're basically saying a bunch of brilliant things, but I'm part of the play that you're the key actor in by making my facial expressions and then, and therefore telling the narrative of what the big, like the big point is, which is fascinating. Makes me, makes me cognizant that I'm supposed to be making facial expressions. Even this conversation is hard because my preference would be to wear a mask with sunglasses to, to where I could just listen. Yes, which I is understand this because it's intrusive to interact with others this way. And yeah. basically uh, Eastern European society have a taboo against that and especially Russia, yeah. uh, the further you go to the East. Yeah. And uh, in the US it's the opposite. You're expected to be hyper animated in your face and you're also uh, expected to show positive affect. Yes. And uh, if you show positive effect without a good reason in Russia, they, people will yes. uh, think you are a stupid, unsophisticated person. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And uh, here, positive effect without reason goes either appreciated or goes unnoticed. No, so, it's the default. It's being expected. Everything is amazing. Uh, <laughs> have you seen uh, th these... Uh, Lego movie? No, there was a diagram where uh, somebody uh, gave the appraisals that exist in in US and Russia. So you have your bell curve, yeah. and, and uh, <laughs> the lower ten uh, percent in, in in US yeah. are uh, it's a good start. <laughs> everything above the lowest ten percent is it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> and uh, for uh, Russians, yeah. everything below the top ten yeah. percent is it's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, everything except the top percent is I don't like it. <laughs> And the top percent is even so. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know it's funny, but it's kind of true. No, yeah. But there's a deeper aspect to this. Uh, it's also how we construct meaning in the U.S. Um, usually, you focus on the positive aspects, and you just suppress the negative aspects. And uh, in our Eastern European traditions, we emphasize uh, the fact that if you hold something above the waterline you also need to put something below the waterline because existence by itself is as best neutral. Right. That's the basic intuition. If at best neutral. Yes. Or it, it could be just suffering. The default is there suffering. There are moments of beauty, but these moments of beauty are inextricably linked to the reality of suffering. Yeah. And uh, to not acknowledge the reality of suffering means that you are really stupid and unaware of the fact yeah. that basically every conscious being spends most of the time suffering. Yeah. You just summarized uh, the ethos of the Eastern Europe, yeah. Most of life is suffering with an occasional moments of beauty. And if your facial expressions don't acknowledge the uh, abundance of suffering in the world and in existence itself, then you must be an idiot. <laughs> it's an interesting thing when you uh, raise children in the yeah. US and you, in some sense, preserve the identity of the intellectual and uh, cultural traditions that are embedded in your own families. And your daughter asks you about Ariel the mermaid. Yeah. And uh, asks you, why is Ariel not allowed to play with the humans? And you tell her the truth. She's What's... a siren. Sirens eat people. You don't play with your foot. It does not end well. <laughs> and then you tell her the original story, which yeah. is not the one by Anderson, which is the romantic one. And there's a much darker one. Which the is Undine story. What happened? So uh, Undine is a, a mermaid um, or a, a water woman. She lives on the ground of a river and she meets this prince and they fall in love. And the prince really, really wants to be with her. And she says, okay, but the deal is you uh, cannot have any other woman if you marry somebody else, even though you cannot be with me, because obviously you cannot breathe underwater and have other things to do than uh, managing your kingdom with yeah. you up here, uh, you will die. And eventually, after a few years, he falls in love with some princess and marries her. And uh, she shows up and quietly goes into his chamber and nobody is uh, able to stop her or willing to do so because she is fierce. Mm -hmm. And she comes quietly and sad out of his chamber and they ask her, what has happened? What did you do? And she said, I kissed him to death. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> and you know the Anderson story, right? 
in der Anderson Story, um, the mermaid is playing with the, uh, this prince that she saves and she falls in love with him and she cannot live out there. So she is giving up her, her voice and her tail for a human-like appearance so she can walk among the humans. But this guy does not recognize that she, uh, she is the one that he would marry. Instead, he marries somebody who has a kingdom and uh, an economical and political relationships to his own kingdom and so on, as he should. It's quite tragic. And well, uh, she dies. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah instead disney uh the little mermaid story has a little bit of a happy ending that's the western that's the american way my own problem is with this of course that i read oscar wilde before i read the other things so i'm inno indoctrinated inoculated with this romanticism and i think that the mermaid is right you sacrifice your life for romantic love that's what you do because yeah. if you are uh confronted with either serving the machine and doing the the obviously right thing under the economic and social and uh, all other human incentives that's wrong you should follow your heart 